It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Please welcome our most special guests, the new Ig Nobel Prize winners. This year's winners represent five continents. Hello and welcome to episode 280 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 29th of October 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. G'day. Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And pain specialist, Dr. Mick Vag. Welcome back. Thanks, Ed. It's been a long time and uh, I'm glad to be back. It's good to have you back. And today we're going to take a look at the Ig Nobel Prizes, the awards that first make you laugh and then make you think. But before we do that, I just want to say a quick thank you to Ryan James, Josh Kingston Lee, Dan Kruger, and all our other generous supporters on Patreon. If you want to help us keep this show going, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. So let's begin with the Physics Prize. French scientist Marc-Antoine Fardin was awarded the Physics Prize for using fluid dynamics to probe the question, can a cat be both a solid and a liquid? And I think we have all just spent the last 10 minutes laughing over the original paper, which is brilliantly written. I think the answer is well and truly, yes, it can be a, both a solid and a liquid, isn't it? Well, especially if you look at the meta-study published by that <laughs> renowned competitor to nature, boardpanda.com. Board panda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Boardpanda.clickbait.com. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, this is basically a fluid dynamics study looking at cats that fit into all sorts of different containers. I think the actual definition of a fluid is something that retains the shape of the container that it's in. And if these photos that are included with the paper are anything to go by, fluids, that cats are definitely fluids. I, it's amazing. Like, I, I love that there's a paper that has so many photos of, that you would normally see on a clickbaity <laughs> website anyway. <laughs> Um, but but some of these photos, and I've seen a lot of them before. But some of these photos, you just look at it and think, did they puree that cat? Like it's just, <laughs> <clears throat> and and some of the <laughs> language in this thing is just fantastic. I just I, I really implore everyone to read this this study just just for the laugh. It is just brilliant. Here's, here I'm looking at a page here. Figure three. A cat spontaneously rotates in a cylindrical jar. And, <laughs> and sure enough, that's what figure three is. <laughs> and and, and the, the cat pillory number. Not <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, that was fantastic, wasn't it? Yes, the cat I just, pillory number. I just caught sight of that. I'm like, oh, you're joking, right? No, that, that's, that's real. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had, uh, and, and I also learned uh, there was such a thing as a Deborah number, which is not like, you know, someone that you met at the bar and you're just like, oh, I've got Deborah's number. No, it's, <laughs> it's the Deborah number is, do people still do that? Do they meet at bars? I don't know. I'm so out of touch with those. those you're asking the wrong person, yeah. um, mate. It's <laughs> Tinder. You agree to meet at a bar when you meet on Tinder, when you match right, on okay. Tinder. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, so a Deborah number is, uh, uh, T over T. is a measure of viscosity. Yeah. So, um, so there you go. Didn't know that. Um, and well, it's a dimensionless, a dimensionless expression of the concept of linear viscoelasticity. This is, uh, it, it's funny, but it was actually, it was prompted by, I think, just looking at a lot of um, pictures of cats on the internet and, and a forum question that someone asked, you know, surely are they not cats, uh, not fluids, because they retain the shape of their container. So uh, definitely check that out. We'll have a link uh, in the show notes and on the website. You can have a look at the funny pictures and also read some fairly technical chemical jargon. <laughs> well, I feel if I had like more of a background in fluid dynamics, I would appreciate this article so much more though. Like, so I feel like almost every second line is quotable. <laughs> yeah, I agree. 
I agree. Older cats may have a shorter relaxation time and thus become <laughs> liquid more easily than agitated kittens. <laughs> <laughs> Stop agitating the kittens. Although it does say at the end, no animals were harmed in the making of this study. So it was actually from 2014. Very the assumption of incompressibility may also fail for older cats, which can acquire gaseous properties. <laughs> That could mean a number of things. <laughs> and, and this is like the uh, like two lines that. later than the one that Penny just read. It's, it, it's just gold. I love this thing. <laughs> uh, but yes, Shane, this is from 2014. The Ig Nobels are not tied to no. the year that they are, looking at, the paper was published. And I'm looking at the author list here. Yeah, University de Leon, the Academy of Bradyologists, whoever they are, and a member of the extended McKinley family. So I don't know who these people are, but that's not the usual author line you have. Anyway, well, yeah, I think one of the one of the recipients was, um, I think it was a high school student when he wrote the paper a few years ago. Uh, which one was it? Yeah, that was the um, coffee uh, one, coffee cup. fluid dynamics prize, which we'll get to. Oh yes, it was. Sorry, on. yeah, different fluid dynamics, not cats, <laughs> coffee. No, there was only one recipient of this one, and this is the physics prize. And that was French scientist Marc-Antoine Fardin. Well, let's move on to the Peace Prize now, which went to four doctors and one patient from Switzerland, Canada, the Netherlands and the USA for demonstrating that regular playing of a didgeridoo <laughs> is an effective treatment for obstructive sleep apnea and snoring. So the Peace Prize, both for peace at home <laughs> and abroad. <laughs> yeah, I like this. Um, <laughs> this... So, yeah, this this came from an anecdotal observation um, that the, the, uh, the, the, an actual didgeridoo instructor, and he noticed that in Switzerland, I didn't even know there would be a didgeridoo instructor in Switzerland, but there you go. <laughs> um, apparently, he noticed that his own sleep apnea symptoms were getting better after he practiced the didgeridoo constantly. Um, and so, they, so they, they recruited 25 adults, um, all who had moderate sleep apnea symptoms, and made them play the didgeridoo, a plastic didgeridoo, not a real one, um, not a real wooden one, which apparently is quite hard to play. Um, and, yeah, they, they made them practice at home quite a lot, like 20 minutes a day. That's a lot of time when you're sitting at home after work going, I really would rather be doing anything than blowing into this stupid tube for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes a day, five days yeah, a week. God. So that's, that's commitment. It's commitment. But apparently... And for four months. For four months, yeah, for four months. But apparently, um, yeah, they have fewer... These people had fewer sleep apnea events than people who didn't do this. So there you go. Yeah, not not a total surprise though, because uh, yeah. uh, there's been you know one of the one of the causes of sleep apnea is um, you know laxity or uh, weakness of the soft palate tends to mm. fall back against the back of the throat as you as you sleep. And uh, you know as a snorer myself, um, I've investigated a number of these things. And there's actually uh, some relatively compelling evidence that singing lessons and you know didgeridoo is oh. is in that as well. It's laryngeal training. It increases your laryngeal muscle tone. And uh, yeah, it's supposed to supposed to be helpful. Um, I'm not a great singer. I'm I can't play the didge at all. So I just still snore away. But um, but yeah, what wasn't a total surprise though this one wasn't uh, so it's, 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 it's not as crazy as it sounds it's right. not so much the circular breathing technique the breathing through your nose while blowing out through your mouth that that's not the reason why this works it's just a strength no, it's more likely the increased strength and muscle tone in the soft balance so yeah. so, th so theoretically you could put like i mean some instruments some woodwind instruments are very you know are relatively easy to play like the flute you don't need a lot of lung power for it but something like i don't know i'm guessing like the trombone or the trumpet, yeah, or the oboe, or the oboe, which needs a lot of force. Maybe that would be a good. Um, yeah. you know, if you can't get hold of the didgeridoo, <laughs> you can. You can try well, something. Well, apparently, the, uh, there's, the there's such a thing as a plastic ditch. I didn't even know this. Isn't that just a PVC pipe? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Apparently, um. What about um, whalers? Oh, they need a Vuvuzela. <laughs> no, 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 no one ever needs a Vuvuzela, ever. No. Can you imagine if some bastard Vuvuzela player learned that circular breathing technique and could thus play? <laughs> oh, yeah. no. They're a toying instrument non-stop. Apparently, um, just to remind me, Ernie Dingo played a didgeridoo, uh, well, he played didgeridoo on a Paul Kelly track, um, I think from Little Things, Big Things Grow, from memory. And apparently he didn't have a didge, so he just, yeah, played a piece of PPC pipe. And it <laughs> it was and quite a ugly head lying around. <laughs> <Fair hand. laughs> 
Uh, um, they at the awards ceremony at uh, Harvard University, where they for the Ig Nobels, they did actually have uh, Alex Suarez, I think it was, who was the original patient who um, went back to the doctor and said, "I don't have sleep apnea. I haven't been using the CPAP machine. I've just been learning the didgeridoo." And yeah, he played a PVC pipe uh, on stage, so it, it definitely works. Here you go. The Economics Prize was awarded to Australian Nancy Greer and American Matthew Rockloff for their experiments to see how contact with a live crocodile affects a person's willingness to gamble. Now, of course, here in Australia, we all have pet crocodiles, so I assume this was a test done on foreign people. Uh, American Would have been experiments. on Englishmen. Yeah. Because they're afraid of everything in this country. <laughs> and you know what? Everything. There's a good reason for that. Most things are trying to kill you. Except some of the shit. Only really the drop bears, Ed. <laughs> so what actually went on here? What, the, the, they have a live crocodile and they're testing people's gambling habits. How does any of this work? Well, I think they were actually, they did their study at a crocodile park and they're actually testing the effect of sort of physiological arousal or that feeling of sort of stress and adrenaline because apparently a lot of gamblers will interpret that as a lucky feeling. So obviously when you gamble, it's quite exciting. Um, I personally find it horrific, but, you know, you do <laughs> get that, you know, the race of heart mm -hmm. and the rush. Um, and to win is great and to lose is awful, but, you know. So what they were testing is a way of getting that rush going without it actually being linked to the gambling. So... People who were participating in the experiment were, um, they were taken to a crocodile park and said, oh, you know, this is the most convenient place for us to do this study. <laughs> so they weren't told that it was um, a crocodile. I'm just picturing a crocodile farm and a row of fruit machines and gamblers just <laughs> hitting the pokey machines. Why? Well, they were divided into two groups. Everyone was given $20. So it was real money, their money that they were gambling with. So, you know, you could have kept the 20 and and um one group went on a tour of the park first which included handling like a baby crocodile and oh. the other group did their gambling exercise first and it was just a pokies game on a laptop okay. and what right. they found was if the participants recorded a sort of a positive mood anyway um the ones who had been in contact with the crocodile were more likely to gamble more so I guess it was just, I think they, in the article from the conversation I read, they said, look, it wasn't the best controlled study <laughs> that's ever been done. And they took pains to say, well, you know, this was done several years ago and our understanding of gambling behaviours mm. has increased since. But when I was trying to explain it to my husband, he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there but, is you possibly know, the an ethics issue here of... <laughs> Uh, exposing people to crocodiles, but I'm sure it was all done very safe. Oh, they were, they were, no, 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 it was like a tourist thing. So they were baby crocodiles with their mouths tied shut. Quite cute, actually. Like, yeah. Cute. <laughs> yes. It was a bit of a letdown, I think, reading the story, because I, what, the headline suggested to me that perhaps the crocodiles were involved somehow in the gamble. It's like, okay, <laughs> here's, uh, Here's a a, 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 th a piece of gold worth this much money, and we're just going to rest it here on this crocodile's tongue. Uh. <laughs> <To gamble. laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that would have made a lot of sense. Actually, you know what? I don't feel like gambling today. That's yeah. fine because, uh, yeah, that would have made more sense. But yeah, they just they just held a one meter long crocodile with its tape its mouth taped shut, and then played a game on a laptop. I don't, I don't know. know. I just I was a little bit let down. Look, some people are having aversion to reptiles, so you know, there would have been a that would have played into it as well, I guess. And the whole idea of touching a what you know is eventually going to grow up to be a predator and a quite an effective one. Maybe that had an effect too. Maybe, but it seemed to be relating to their um, their self-reported mood level yes. and their um, uh, how excited they became mm. from holding the crocodile. And I, I have never held a crocodile, but I have held snakes before, and I know the feeling of holding snakes, just that... You know the um, you just get this sense of power. They've just got so much, all you know, all that muscle beneath the mm. the surface. So I, I imagine a croc would be pretty similar. So that would be pretty exciting, I guess. Okay, um, well, don't go gambling after you've uh, <laughs> after you've had a, a reptile, I guess. That was the uh, well, or, or or should you? 
I think it depends. The thing is, it seemed to have an effect um, on some people uh, that made them want well. to gamble more, yeah. and others who want to gamble less. So it seems a little bit hit and miss, the old crocodile uh, uh, approach. So uh, I guess yeah, I you'd think, have I to think. So I, was to say, I think where they're coming from with this study as well is it's to do with the genetics of people who have gambling problems um, mm. because often people who have uh, genetic mutations that result in low resting serotonin levels are people who need external sources of stimulation to make mm -hmm. them feel normal. Um, so when you have, uh, and gambling is well known to be one of those things where you have sort of high, high risk, high reward strategies uh, get used as a way of generating that endogenous serotonin which isn't being naturally produced and and so the idea why they've chosen a crocodile is i said it's an element of fear and it's it's you know it's exciting and uh that the, it's not surprising that that would correlate with the risk-taking behaviour because um, we see similar things in actually interestingly enough in in people with pain problems. Um, there's, there's my all-time favourite uh, research tool, which is called the Iowa Rodent Gambling Task. And uh, right. it's actually where you get uh, it's actually where you get rats to make a decision about which door they're going to open, and there'll either be no food or there'll be a consistent amount of food. And the the door that has no food occasionally will have lots of food. So they use a random reinforcement paradigm. And um, animals who have pain consistent, like if you inject a bit of um, formalin or something into their paw to give them pain that will last for two or three days, they will they will more consistently use a high-risk, high-reward strategy because um, they're disinhibited compared to normal. Um, wow. And mm -hmm. this is a similar sort of study that they've done here is they're, they're putting these humans in a situation where they're, you know, they're giving them a bit. And, and I note they chose people with a pre-existing gambling problem mm. um and so they're they're people whose physiology is probably not normal and they're not, not normally wired if you like they're wired to be vulnerable to addiction um and uh so not surprisingly one arousing type experience of, of fear and excitement and everything um enhances another one so it's really quite an interesting i see where they're coming from with this study mm. as, as bizarre as it is yeah Mm. Uh, it reminds me also of things like um, studies that show if you go shopping, like grocery shopping, and you're hungry, you tend to buy more fatty foods and things like that. It's just our moods are constantly uh, affecting our decisions that we make. And so if we're in pain or if we're having a negative uh, experience because we're being attacked by a crocodile, we're not necessarily going to make the best decisions. <laughs> That's the epitome of a negative experience. <laughs> <laughs> Being attacked by a crocodile. Yeah, I don't your day it. tends to get better after that, hopefully. <laughs> or, or worse, depending on how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. The Anatomy Prize was awarded to James Heathcote from the UK for his medical research study, Why Do Old Men Have Big Ears? <laughs> <laughs> And this is a study where the, he actually looked at a number of people and monitored them over years, and their ears do grow. I think it's something like two millimeters per decade. They increase in length. So isn't it like fingernails and ears are the th two things that don't ever stop growing or something, or hair and fingernails and ears now? Something about cartilage, I guess. Yeah. Um, did, did they, I think apparently that the, the evidence for that is a bit sketchy, though. Um, but apparently, yeah. Well, apparently that was this, the finding of this study, that the ears yeah. don't actually grow. They it's just get stretched. Yeah. They're sad. And, and in they're women, sad. that makes Gravity sense. does gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. But, I mean, yeah, in women that makes sense because women tend to wear, you know, well, so big, ear, big like earrings compared to, yeah. say, men, especially on that age bracket we're talking about. Um, but apparently um, it might be a bit negated in the case of women because of the way they wear their hair, so they might not notice it as much. Um, also, I don't yeah. know if he studied women. Did he only study Yeah, yeah. They did. Oh, yeah. okay. They did. Yeah, the findings are backed up, uh, blah, blah, blah. There, there, was, there was some other studies as well, but yeah, they measured the ears of randomly selected group of 206 of their patients over the age of 30, um, mm. and yeah, it was, it was men and women, yeah. and, right. and so it affected both. And that, that's backed up by other studies that were done in the 90s as well. Yeah. And apparently you can get surgery. I was really, inter this, so. <laughs> I was really interested that, in this because um, my uh, a few of my old uncles had massive ears as they got older, but it was the hairiness of them that was the thing. Mm. I was, yeah, was, was going to say, say something about, about the, hair? the hair in the ears. <laughs> well, maybe that's part of the reason why they, they sag because they get weighed the down of all by all the hair. hair. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you find hair doesn't weigh that much, mate. But anyway. Well, know, I don't know. Does. I've got a lot of hair. You've got a lot yeah. of hair, Shane. What Mine does. But yeah, I know. But not, not in my years, mate. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyway. Give me time. Uh, it'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. I'm sure it'll happen. I, was yeah. getting, I was getting a haircut the morning of my 40th birthday party. And uh, the, the very tactful well, young lady her. was cutting... Yeah, she was cutting my hair and then just very – she paused for a second with the scissors <laughs> and then just did a very quick little snip snip on the top of the ear and then went back to the hair. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awful. Now I am old. <laughs> <laughs> wow, see, uh, see, haircut. I don't think I've had a haircut since I was probably 19. Yeah, anyway. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, apparently my, my haircuts now include ear and nose as well. <laughs> well yes. it's, a full bar, it's a full, like, barbershop kind of thing. <laughs> you might as well just go, go the whole hog, mate. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. The biology prize went to two scientists <laughs> from Japan, one from Brazil, and one from Switzerland for their discovery of a female penis and a male vagina in a cave mm. insect. I love this story. It, it really? This just makes me wonder, what's the definition of a vagina well, or a penis? I'm well, it's interesting. I mean, so this is a, another Ed Yong story. Of course it is, because he, he seems to write about all these weird ones. Um, what makes it a penis, even though it... Um, it so the, so the, the female has the penis and she basically inserts it into the male. And But the difference is the male delivers his sperm through the female's penis. So, yeah, into, the, um, into her. So that's what makes it a penis. The fact. That, the I fact thought it was the, yeah, that the size of the gametes says that she's female. That, I think that might be yeah. too, but it's also the way it works. Because, you know, she basically, so in a lot of the animals, apparently in the penis, you have like little spines to, you know, anchor themselves. And apparently this female penis is the same thing. Like it's little spines that the anchors are in place. Sometimes they, these sexual bouts last up to 70 hours. So, yeah, you have these two insects. Doing this for seventy hours. I mean, that's wow. That's that's stamina. Um, <laughs> well, I think well, I think you have one doing it, and I think you have one. Well, yeah, up basically. It. Apparently, and they said, and apparently, if you try to separate them, you can you you, you kill the male, basically, or, or or in the words of the researchers, the male kind of broke. Quote end quote. <laughs> 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 oh, that's horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Um, it becomes a matter of you know what do you. <laughs> You know, you, you sort of you sort of wading into some murky territory. You, you know, what do you call a penis? What do you call the vagina? What do you know? Yeah. And yeah, I I read a similar article I think, and it was saying how you know how you know the the old saying that fish can't you know fish don't have a word for water or whatever, but that mm. we are so sort of entrenched in our gender views that we apply this idea of male and female to animals where it's just not really appropriate, like. Even it was the, the article I read was talking about ants and how oh all the worker ants are female and you know yada yada mm. yada. But what does that really mean? Like why are we yeah. so keen to classify everything as male and mm. female? Mm. What you really want to be saying is that there's an external vagina and an internal yeah. penis, or something yeah. like that is yeah. really what's going on. Um, we don't know the gender necessarily. I mean, I assume that that can be something that you can genetically determine. I mean, are there Chromosomes? Well, it said, I don't know. The article that I read was saying it's not even determined chromosomally. It's simply like who produces the biggest gametes. Yeah. Mm. So whoever's gametes are bigger is the female. Is the female, yeah. But, I mean. It doesn't, yeah. It, it, could, it could be turned around. I mean, you've got this situation here where you've obviously got this normal paradigm flipped around. So who's to say that it isn't flipped around the other way too? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah but the I, female I haven't produces it eggs. Very well, but, the f- yeah. The, the, yeah, the mm. female one produces eggs, so mm. that's pretty, pretty obviously. If that's uh, the case, then yeah. Did you see the other thing where these insects, where the male gives like little sperm gifts, <laughs> which are quite, <laughs> they're quite nutritious. So even yeah. females who are reproductively immature will just take the gifts and eat them. Mm. What are they called? And, and fair packages, enough, I think. Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair enough too, because it says where they live in the cage. Oh, yeah, where they live in the caves, there all they have to eat is yeah. Dead there's bats. nothing much to eat, like so. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd, that sounds like a more nutritious thing to be doing mm. than eating dead bats. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's what I've always said that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Come on, out, baby, it's out. better than eating a dead bat. <laughs> <laughs> Look, regardless of all this, I mean, that they're they're a very interesting um, species. Uh, you know, they're very. It it does turn that it does turn that paradigm around. Obviously, like it's not it's not usual if you want to put it that yeah. way. So yeah, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's something different, but it does mm. also challenge the way we think about the terminology that we use, which is yes, definitely. never a bad thing. Yeah. No. And we mentioned it before, but the Fluid Dynamics Prize went to South Korean Jiwon Han for studying the dynamics of liquid sloshing to learn what happens when a person walks backwards while carrying a cup of coffee. And as we mentioned, he was a high school student when he wrote the paper. Basically, he's looking at why coffee slops out of a coffee mug, and that's to do with the container, the, the shape of the container, and the resonant frequencies of walking. And apparently walking backwards gives you a smoother motion than walking forward. And carrying the coffee cup by th in a claw-like motion from the top rather than holding the handle will also minimize that those sloshing effects. I uh, thought there had been a study, I had read something about a study into this years ago. Like, I don't know whether I read anything to do with this show or just no, no, no. my I think travels. We, I couldn't find it. I think we might have talked about it. I think it might have even been another Ig Nobel Prize, um, which was just looking at the resonant effects of walking with coffee and why that um, why you will spill coffee from walking often. This basically just takes that a step further and looks at things like the shape of the vessel and the patterns of walking forward or backwards. Uh, so is the this the first documented evidence of an Ig Nobel Prize um, uh, spawning the research that won another Ig Nobel Prize? I don't know if they were related at all. I don't know if uh, Jiwon Han saw the earlier research and then decided to expand on that. I'm not... I think I the story is he got frustrated by spilling his own coffee. Yeah. <laughs> The critical thing from this article was the fact that we should be drinking our coffee out of wine glass. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Yeah. Forget well, about you know. carrying it. If you've, if you've got it in a nice Rydell, a Shiraz-shaped Rydell, you're not going to spill it. <laughs> you hold it by the steam. Why go there? Why not skip to straight drinking wine? <laughs> Why bother with the coffee at all? I think Why if I just decided to use wine glasses all day, at least people would know what time of day it was by looking at what was in my glass. <laughs> That's true. So if it's after, so so if it's wine, it's after ten. Yeah. Oh, it's so good! That's exactly what I was going. To say. <laughs> <laughs> the other cool thing I liked about this one, though, is he one of the methods that he looked at the oscillation frequency and the resonance and all of that was very down to earth. He got his phone, wrote a little program to monitor the uh, accelerometer differences, strapped it to a coffee cup, and walked and went. Ah, well, this is more of an even line if I'm walking backwards or if I'm holding it this way, which is clever, you know, everyday science. I like it. Um, I do challenge the um, the claw hand grasp method, <laughs> though. It's, it's not a perfect best. solution. <laughs> uh, I just, I reckon, because uh, I've, I have arguably much greater experience than Han does <laughs> with carrying coffees. And uh, just on account of being much older and drinking lots of coffee and also being prone to move. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I reckon uh, the, you, can, you can apply a similar technique from holding it from the underneath as well. Or I actually am pretty adept. I, I have found, and I don't know if this is, if this is a, uh, a well-known thing and I've just stumbled on a, a, a truth, but um, you do so much better if you're not looking at the coffee. You know, if you're, if you're looking straight ahead, it doesn't move around as much. I don't know why that is. Is that a thing? Confirmation bias, no, I think. There's a paper and a possibly an Ig Nobel Prize in it. <laughs> Did you say there's a motion bias there? Is that what uh, you confirmation said? bias, because oh, you never see when you spill yeah, it. Agreed. Well, yeah, you hear it, though, and it slops on your feet. Uh, the <laughs> other method that Han points out of uh, not spilling your coffee is to get, and it's called a lid. And you yeah. put that over your coffee cup. Apparently, that works just as well. I was just going to say, you know, a freaking keep cup or something. <laughs> you know, something with yep. a lid. Yep. <laughs> God's sake. See, there's another. We've got so many product ideas. <laughs> there should be a, a keep cut called a freaking keep cut. 
<laughs> and the nutrition prize, which is somewhat comical given. Oh, is that uh, the sperm gifts? <laughs> well, no, the, no, that was biology. <laughs> they, they, there's it's slightly related given a, a previous comment made on the but, show. Yes. But the nutrition prize went to three scientists from Brazil, Canada, and Spain for the first scientific report of human blood in the diet of a hairy legged vampire bat. So most people think of vampire bats, oh, they're human uh, pests, they, they, they eat humans. Until they this humans. particular. Sorry. Wow. That, wouldn't that be a cannibal bat? Oh, no, I guess it's eating humans, it's not a cannibal, is it? They'll be eating bats. No. You're thinking <laughs> carnivore, perhaps? <laughs> Predator bat. But <laughs> up until this, there had been no actual rep- scientific reports or observations of that happening. They'd all been uh, found with blood from other animals in them. And uh, I'm, I forget when this article was first published, but it was fairly recent. It was in the last 10 years or so, I think. Yeah, so he got a Brazilian honor student... Um, to essentially <laughs> just extract, figure out a good DNA extraction method from guano. Um, and yeah, I, I can tell you, guano, or any feces is really, really hard to get DNA out of that's in a, any good because feces is a horrible, harsh environment that just destroys stuff. Um, but yeah, she did. And she got lots of different kinds of DNA from it, including you know goats, pigs, cows, dogs, chickens, and also a human, which is weird because these bats are supposed to only feed on birds. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it, so it turns out that what's probably happening, and this is a bit sad, um, because, you know, the Brazilian rainforest and everything, um, their habitat is very, very quickly being destroyed, including all the species they would normally feed on. So they're becoming opportunistic feeders. And they're, wow. feeding on, yeah, that's that. I think that's the, that's the, um, the hypothesis anyway. They're becoming much more flexible. So, so the, the assumption. Or the, that they only feed on birds. Were the bats aware of that? Or was that just the... Uh... <laughs> I think <laughs> the bats are aware. <laughs> and did anyone tell these bats? God, you yeah, did anyone them. tell the bats they're not <laughs> meant to feed on goats? Yeah, and... No, 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 guys, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Look, yeah. it's quite possible that they've always been opportunistic feeders, but birds yeah. are probably their, their preferred prey, I guess. But um, now, yeah. I mean, the thing is also these little bats, the bamboo bats are tiny. They're not exactly, you know, they're not, in, in the, in the, um, in popular culture, you have this idea of this huge big vampire bat that swoops down and, you know, latches onto you and doesn't let go. These things are tiny. So you probably wouldn't even notice them feeding on you. So, which makes Apparently sense. Apparently there's been previous studies um, on this particular uh, vampire bat from the 60s and the 80s and, and even the mid 90s that, that uh, indicated that in captivity, these bats would rather die. They'd rather starve to death than feed on blood from cows or mm. rabbits or rats or yeah. pigs or live goats. So, but then again, I guess it comes down to how how are they being presented with that? Yeah. Like, is it is is a cow just put in their cage? <laughs> and also, so captivity captivity is very very different to mm. their normal yeah. habitat. So I'm guessing that there were lots of other factors there. Like maybe we don't really want to eat anything because I'm very very stressed out. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah well, every time it's, I've lived yeah. in captivity, I've I sort of lost my appetite, and I haven't mm. eaten the normal things that I eat. Yeah, you used to put the lotion on your skin though, didn't you? Oh <laughs> 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 uh, dear. <laughs> I think it's a fair trade, though. If we trash their habitat, they start drinking our blood. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. the, I mean, the other the other problem is here. There's the risk of rabies here because it's you know bats are a well known. Yeah, that's not a fair trade. Rabies. So yeah, I mean, th- this could definitely in- increase the transmission of rabies, which is not a great thing. Um, yeah. Mm. So yeah. yeah, it's a bit sad, really. Like it's very cute, but also very sad. You know, cute in a little vampire bat latching onto you kind of way. Yeah, th- how is that cute? <laughs> I don't know. I just find it kind of cute. I've always liked the idea of vampire bats. I mean, I don't want to ever, you know, have one feeding off me, but I like the idea. Of them. Well, they're just like giant big mosquitoes, aren't they? Really? Yeah. Actually, when you put it that way, <laughs> yeah, you're... actually, no. That's a that's an interesting point because the mosquitoes. Uh, I think it's just the females, isn't it, that that yeah. take blood and they use it as part of their breeding cycle. Whereas these things actually, they can only live on blood. Apparently, mm. like that. That's that is their diet. Very niche diet, isn't it? Well, at least they've expanded out to other yeah. species. 
The Medicine Prize went to five scientists from France and the UK for using advanced brain scanning technology to measure the extent to which some people are disgusted by cheese. Apparently, some people are disgusted by cheese, and I'm not sure they're human. I, I, th- I think that's exactly the point. That, that is actually what inspired this research. <laughs> because someone said, what? You're disgusted by cheese. What the hell is wrong with you? We need to understand your brain. I think that's that's exactly the process that, that took place here in choosing to do this study. Yeah, I was interested in this study for a couple of reasons. One, um, I'm absolutely appalled by goat's cheese. I cannot eat it. Really? I've, I've really eaten some of just goat's cheese. I love most yeah. other types of cheese. Cannot do goat's cheese at all. <laughs> um, and and the other thing is that, that a lot of this fMRI stuff about aversion, um, again, relates to a lot of the literature we look at through pain management and um, some of these areas that are involved in, in really deep aversive responses um, uh, are easily wired into um, people's uh, chronic pain type circuits so they they can actually become phobic of movement or phobic of things that remind them about their pain and uh this this aversion thing is actually uh it's it's an area of research that i'm uh, reasonably familiar with um so so this was actually again another one of those interesting studies where there's this sort of cross-pollination between um you know different ways of approaching what are essentially similar emotional responses but um yeah geez i hate goat's cheese <laughs> I'm, uh, that is fascinating because yeah, I don't get it. I, 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 I find goat cheese like quite benign, really, compared to other cheeses. It's not. Yeah, ha, anyway. Have you? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you're right. It's not like a smelly cheese or anything. Yeah. It's, really, it's, a it's just. Cre- it's, a, it's a creamy soft cheese. I don't really get the the hate. Is, is, yeah. it, is it a um? Is it a texture thing or is it actually the taste? No, it's the it's it's the it's the lingering taste. It's, oh, it's just yeah, not yeah. right. It's not right. No. Have <laughs> you done a blinded experiment of this? Has everyone given you goat's cheese without you knowing it's goat's cheese? Um, yep, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to eat blue cheese mm. and oh, I will, nice. I'll make a lovely uh, gru- uh, sorry, um, not gruyere, but the uh, uh, gorgonzola and mm. garlic uh, sauce to have on yeah, steaks so and stuff. Really absolutely stuff, love it. Yeah. Yep, yep. Happy with that. I mean, it smells like my running shoes, but it's fine. <laughs> um, but goat's cheese just cannot do. And I've, 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 you know, I went to Spain where they make, you know, the manchego, which is supposed to be the pinnacle of all goat's cheeses in the world. And uh, no, nah, couldn't do it. Couldn't yeah. even finish a slice of it. No dice. Yeah, cheese. Nah. Hmm. Wow. So just going back to what you were saying about the aversion and 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 um, studying aversion and how it can link in with the pain, you know, sort of pathways is. Is it likely then that that's involved with my very strong aversion to Tony Abbott? Because when I see, <laughs> when I even see him, I just feel repulsed, and it seems very much wired into the deep centres of my brain. I'd, I, it'd be interesting to see what how I react on an fMRI. Well, yeah. you probably try and uh, you get showed pictures of people that you want to headbutt, or. <laughs> no, I think that I don't think we'll ever find out because there's surely that's an ethics violation showing people pictures of Tony Abbott. No one should be inflicted with that yeah, when they don't have an opportunity to escape. <laughs> so, 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 just on back to you know back to reality. Um, we're just reading this article. Apparently, for, and I, maybe I misunderstood this, but so when they did the fMRI and they, and they showed pictures of people you know who hated cheese, pictures of cheese, and said you know. And they looked at the um, the blood flow to the regions of the brain. They found that apparently it also seemed to flow in parts that are usually associated with mechanisms of reward. Mm. So in this case, but in this case, it's obviously a mechanism mechanism of disgust. So it's yeah, although like there was there was one there was one there was the area in the pallidum which is um, normally associated with the positivity and reward, yeah. um, and the areas that lit up were uh, other different part of the basal ganglia, uh-huh. and, and the difference between disgust and. Um, liking the cheese was when you liked it, they all lit up. So you had the whole, the full hand. Mm-hmm. And when you when you didn't like it, you only had part of it lighting up. Right. Okay. And uh, so, so, so same it pathway, seems like just different amount, different amounts. Exactly. So of, a yeah. different, a different pattern. Yeah. yeah um, okay. So it's so it seems like um, if you get the if you get the whole lot, you love it. Uh, yeah. If you don't get the whole lot, you're averse to it. Right. I agree with you, Penny. The blue cheese is yuck. 
No, you're wrong. Oh, it's awful. Blue cheese is okay. <laughs> both wrong. I actually really want to like it. I just can't. I get that same kind of. Ugh, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it the mold? Is it the molder version? It's not an intellectual thing. It's just the taste. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I like things like camembert and brie. Yeah, which are multi too. Yeah. 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 So it's no, not the it, knowledge of the mould, it's just the sharpness. Right. Yeah, it is yeah. very sharp, blue cheese. Yeah. Yeah. It's a reminds you of running shoes is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also one of those coriander tastes like soap people, so who knows? Ah, but I'm not. My wife's like that. So. She hates coriander too. I found out my, my oldest son hates it the other day. He didn't know So he put a whole lot of it on his, uh, on his homemade burger. In, oh, uh, that's sad. Informed us that apparently he hates coriander. He's ruined, he's ruined his burger. That's just terrible. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh. See, I, I quite like coriander, but yeah, I, I, I get that that's a genetic thing. But um, yeah. All right. The cognition prize went to four psychologists from Italy, Spain, and the UK for demonstrating that many identical twins cannot tell themselves apart visually. Which sounds kind of silly because obviously you know who you are. But this is if you're shown. And it was just the face uh, with blacked out hair and everything around it. So you only sort of get the oval of the face. They can't even tell themselves apart. Kind of makes sense, I guess, but mm. kind of interesting. I think it does kind of make sense. And when you think about this, I reckon mothers are probably the mothers and, and partners when they're older are probably the best ones to tell them apart because they see them a lot more than the twins see themselves. You know what I mean? They probably see, I mean, they would definitely see their twin more than they see themselves. If that makes Maybe. Sense. Like they, they would see their, their, their sibling more often than they, they would see themselves in a mirror. It's not well, like, no. Well, but if most they... people don't stare at themselves in a mirror for hours and hours at a time. No, I but assume, I but probably they... would look at myself in the mirror when I shave in the morning. I don't necessarily see my brothers that often. You know what I mean? Not now. Well, sure. Well, but that's but what I'm I saying. don't know like what age mothers... they were tested at. Yeah, no, that, that wasn't apparent. But I, I, I suspect that mothers and... Partners are more, especially mothers, who would see both of the siblings together often, mm. unless they're a Weasley, because you can't tell. <laughs> but context is really important because you've got, you know, in, in your insular cortex, you've got a map of the space around you and, and what's you and what's not you. And if that gets damaged or injured by a stroke or, you know, brain injury or something, then you do get people who have trouble telling what is them and what is not them and um, have this interesting phenomenon in people um, with amputations where they can mm. embody they can embody external objects which are within the sphere of where their body would normally be like a prosthesis and they uh, you know doing things to their prosthesis can feel to them uh, like you're doing it actually to their their whole body and you know it's it's the the bodily integrity part includes the space where the prosthesis is um, and the interesting thing about those systems is that they only rely on just having a good enough idea and this is where I think this this study is interesting because they've shown them they've shown them the picture without a context and it's it looks enough like them that uh. the, the brain will accept it, but it's out of context that fills in whether it's actually them or not. So there's no yep. spatial context or other context around it. Can I just say um, uh, that just in, in response to what you just said there, the, the phrase doing things to their pro prosthesis sounds really creepy to me. I don't know why. It just yeah. sounds... It, I don't know. It's wrong. I, I had a, a oh. I had a goat cheese reaction to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that what we're calling it now? <laughs> oh, well, it's it's an issue when we're when we're teaching uh, you know younger doctors about how to interact with uh, people that have had amputations, and uh, you know you you actually have to be quite respectful, understanding that they may have embodied that prosthesis. So you don't just, just you don't just walk it. over and start taking it off and go, wow, the carbon fibers are amazing. Oh, <laughs> you, you know you just don't do that. It's just like you know, walking over and pulling someone's pants down and commenting on what their legs are like. Wow. Right. So, so yeah, that's that's the context I'm talking about, yeah. But context is the right word because also this is talking about... With, I think we pick up on little clues a lot and a lot of our identification of other people, for example, particularly if, like me, you're not very good at recognising faces, we pick up on things like their gait... Uh, their hairstyle, uh, facial expressions and everything. So when you're presented with just a neutral, that oval of their face with nothing else, I think, yeah, it'd be hard for most people to tell. 
Yeah, Do you know fun. what the classic thing is as a doctor when you're in theatre? Um, Recognising theatre nurses outside of theatre is incredibly ah. difficult because you always see them in scrubs, you yeah. always see them with the uh, hair covered up. And when you when you see them at the Christmas break up, it takes you a second to recognise them sometimes. <laughs> All right. The last prize, the obstetrics prize, went to a team from Spain for showing that a developing human fetus responds more strongly to music that is played electromechanically inside the mother's vagina than to music that is played electromechanically on the mother's belly. Now, Penny, you've had two children. Yep, yep. <laughs> My response is, is it whoop de frickin' do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't God. give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> But they yeah, sing along, like, Penny. They sing along. So, so you wouldn't do the baby pod thing, Penny? You, you, you Look, wouldn't... in a society where ultrasounds are, you know, regularly used, the process of having two children is not dignified. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, great, great. That's great to know. Great. Glad you found someone who would, like, help you do this study. Fantastic. You Thank never you. got the urge to sing and dance along with your unborn child, you know, just to play some music to it. Because I've heard that Mozart actually makes them a lot more intelligent when they're born. Isn't that right, uh, Mick? Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, they come out being able to play chess. All I've ever wanted is some kind of music player up there. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a karaoke tampon, isn't it? Oh, wow. So, they're, they're saying that the fetus sings along. They say the fetus sings along. Now, sings along is a stretch. All I noticed was some mouth movements from the fetus. So, um, Ed, Ed, you, Ed, you may not have looked at the website for the product associated You're right, with I this. did not. Apparently, the baby it. sings along. <laughs> So the product that we're talking about uh, was developed by this team as well, and it's a commercially available product. I don't know if it is yet or it will be soon. <laughs> it's called the Baby Pod. You can connect it to your smartphone and play music directly up, and you can listen along too. I think it splits to uh, normal headphones, so you can just jam with your with your babies. The, well, the good thing is the app beautiful. comes with a list of the most stimulating songs for oh, the baby, apparently. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and? Well, I have to say, a lot of children's music, you wouldn't want to listen to it. So maybe that's a good thing. Oh, I'm sure it's mostly maybe that's death exactly metal. Why, yeah, maybe that's exactly why the babies were making you know, facial movements. They were trying to articulate their disgust. <laughs> they were trying to Don't say, shut more up. Wiggles. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just because, yeah, I mean, honestly, just because the babies are moving their mouths and stuff doesn't mean they're actually happy. Uh, I think that's yeah. the, 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 that's the, yeah, yeah. That, that's what they fall down. Oh, but a mother can tell. A mother knows these things. <laughs> I did like that the uh, the study indicated that the babies just if if moving their mouth is a reaction to it, which they they you know obviously you've got to accept that that's a, 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 a reaction to the stimuli. They said that with with no stimuli, the the babies you know move their mouth a baseline of whatever, and then with with uh, music on the outside of the belly, they 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 didn't really move their mouths more. But then with the music you know administered in this fashion, um, then they they <laughs> they they move their mouths a lot more. Maybe maybe they were also like us were freaking out over that it was being administered in this fashion. It's like, seriously, that's very invasive. Well, I, I mean, honestly, it's probably more like, along the lines, this is a foreign noise. I don't really get this. What is this? How do you even know what volume to play it at? Oh, God, yeah. Like, maybe they were yeah. deafening the baby. But it's also interesting that um, dissonant noises that were administered in this fashion did not elicit a response either. So, so non-musical yeah, they, noise. They did have a control. That's right. They had a control mm. where they played white noise. Yeah. <laughs> God. And the babies, were, they didn't move their mouths anymore. They didn't comment on the baby's arm movements as to whether it was playing <laughs> it along was with the guitar solo. And, 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 did they say, and did they say, sorry, did they say what kind of music they played? Like, did they play, you know, pop music? Did they play heavy metal? Did they play classical? What did they actually um, play to these babies? I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through the paper. Hang on. Uh, I think I did see something about... So, yeah. Keep talking amongst yourselves while I scan. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I got. I was just like, I'm not interested in this. Uh, I, I think Penny had a blue cheese reaction to that. Yeah, I was like, nope, nope, nope. Uh, I feel I've listened to the soundtrack to Frozen on repeat enough in the car. Like, yeah, there's no way you'd need that anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think we might leave it there. Uh, go to scienceontop.com slash 280 for more information if you want more information about uh, this year's Ig Nobel Award uh, stories. Leave us a comment, uh, especially if you've ever used a baby pod, uh, or leave us a message on our social media sites, and why not leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And of course, go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help support the show. Dr. Mick Vag, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ed. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Penny, Shane, and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. You went. No, it's not. And a very special thank you to the old man with very big ears who edited this show, Marcos Benamu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. As you know, we, uh, we used to have a problem at this ceremony. Many of the speakers would exceed their allotted time. Here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, the delightful, the ever so cute Miss Sweetie Pooh. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Pooh is eight years old. Miss Sweetie Pooh, would you please demonstrate what you will do when somebody exceeds his or her allotted time? Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Now, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Thank you, Miss. Now, Miss Sweetie Pooh will. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Sweetie. Miss. Whenever somebody. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. So, are cats uh, liquid? I saw uh, this question asked on the internet, and. Uh, it was based on the common definition that a liquid is a material that can adapt uh, its shape to its container. And it, <laughs> it seems to be the case. So basically what I uh, said in the paper is that... Uh, <laughs> Please stop. Please stop. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you. And we did a randomized trial, and this trial showed actually that after four months of playing the didgeridoo five times a week, that it reduces daytime sleepiness, the main symptoms, snoring, and apneas during sleep. And this actually showed that the sleep apnea may be treated by this exercise-based active type of treatment, which was a kind of a proof-of-concept study. So we are very happy to receive this honor, this prize, and I can also tell you now about another study. We have a demonstration. I'd like, uh, to, in particular, to thank my uh, family, um, my wife, who said uh, um, that uh, when I asked what's exciting in central Queensland that we could use to, um, to motivate people to, uh, to, to gamble, she said, well, uh, crocodiles were chock-a-block with crocodiles. Um, so, uh, so, so that's what we used. Um, and uh, Nancy wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, also thank Nancy, who actually did all the work on this project. Um, <laughs> when <I'm laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Have you ever sat on a bus and noticed that the old man opposite you has very big ears? <laughs> Once you've spotted it, it is impossible to imagine those enormous ears on a younger man. And so, they must have grown. 
Twenty years ago, we set out to prove this by measuring the ears of 206 patients. <laughs> and we put it on a graph, and it's true. <laughs> on average, your ears grow by about two millimetres a year, which is about, sorry, two millimetres a decade. Thank you for inviting me tonight. For everyone who's helped me to get this ear-shattering piece of research <laughs> completed and published, make of it what you will. Thank you. And back in high school, I had a bit too much free time to myself, so I decided to write a physics paper about it, 15 pages long. And through a series of surprisingly rigorous mathematical arguments, I have found out the secret to not spilling coffee. You hold it from the top, you gaze straight forward and start walking backwards. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Is this practical? Absolutely not. Not at all. Frankly, for those who want to not spill their coffee, that's why the lid was invented. <laughs> However, I did learn a very important lesson from this research, and it is that research is not about how old you are. It's not about how smart you are. It's about how much coffee you can drink. Thank you. From all of us, please remember this final thought. If you didn't win an Ig Nobel Prize this year, and especially if you did, better luck next year. Thank you. Thank you.